The following is part of a national PBS series called Sinking Cities, produced in conjunction with Peril and Promise, a WNET New York initiative telling stories of climate change around the world. We're here at the home of Angela Chalk. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So your organization focuses on helping people in the seventh ward alleviate flooding through installing things like rain barrels and rain gardens. How did you first get excited about this kind of work? Well, this started with uh, my great niece who they were re experiencing flooding on their playground at school. And so we had this conversation about what happened at school that week. And so she started to explain to me about rain gardens and what it meant. Um, from there, it just blossomed into a passion by, first of all, learning what a rain garden is, what's green infrastructure. So tell us more about the Seventh Ward and why you focused your projects here. First of all, I live here. Um, I'm a fourth generation New Orleanian. I live in a house that my grandfather won in a card game. And most importantly, because it, this is an area that's prone to flooding. And it's an Afri predominantly African-American community. And folks are, are busy working, so they're not paying attention to what is um, happening as with respect to flooding until it's an acute issue. And so Healthy Community Services is changing that, that lens at the way people look at um, urban stormwater flooding, coastal land loss, um, sea level rise, and climate change. And so we go about engaging and educating and empowering residents around those issues to start to make incremental changes by installing such things as a green infrastructure intervention. Uh, to date, we have nine projects within the boundaries of the Seventh Ward collecting close to 10,000 gallons of water wow. uh, to reduce flooding in our, in our area. So can you tell us a little about the rain garden we're sitting in front of now? Actually, it's a bioswill because the rain garden is a depressed area that's circular and the bioswill is linear. And the, what happens with the bioswill, we put in native plants and aggregate to absorb the water. So as high as these plants are, the roots are as deep. This particular bioswill captures 350 gallons of water. It infiltrates into the earth raising our water table. So 350 gallons of water on this side alone never gets into the storm system. When it reaches its capacity, then it's a slower amount that goes into our storm system. So is that as much or more as might run off your house on a big rainstorm, during Co a big rainstorm? Correct. If it's a big rainstorm, it will get to capacity. And within 72 hours, it has gone back into the water table, so there's no mosquito larvae there. Um, we just um, did maintenance on it by keeping it clean to make sure that it's working properly. And the, the microorganisms that we saw in there was amazing. Um, even when the, the native plants start to bloom, it's always exciting to see how they just pop out at you. Uh, so in this particular bioswale, there's um, palmetto saw, muley grass, Louisiana irises. It's all native plants, native to Louisiana. So in these particular plants don't mind being wet. So that's why they're the ones that we use in uh, the bioswale, along with the mulch of pine needles. So it helps to break down and feed the bioswale as well. So do you notice a big difference then when there's a storm? Like, oh, did there used absolutely. to be? What used to happen was the backyard used, used to flood. And now that water is transported around um, into the bioswale. So I no longer have flooding in the backyard. And when we have a heavy rain event, the water is slow to go into the drains on this side of the street and it's very fast on the other side of the street. How have your neighbors reacted to your sort of greening of your space? Uh, the neighbors are really excited because in fact this fall, each neighbor on this block will get a, uh, a type of green intervention project so that this will be um, a green block. And so we're working with the city to have it deemed as such so that other residents can come out and look at the the different types of interventions that's going on. We want to serve as a model to show what community-driven action looks like. So your organization is actually going to help everyone on this block to install bioswales and rain gardens? That's correct. Cool. And they're pretty excited about it? Everyone is excited. And it's inclusive of everyone. So if you're a renter, you can have something as simple as a, as a rain barrel to do your share. So everyone on this block will receive a type of green intervention project. So what's your elevator pitch? Uh, they, you know, my neighbors see what it is that I'm doing in the community, so I'm considered as valid and reliable. <laughs> and so, the, and the fact that I live here, 
So I'm not only uh, walking the walk, I'm in talking the talk, I'm actually doing it and they see the changes that are occurring. Um, so through education and outreach, um, this is how we move this, 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 this forward. These are pretty small scale yes. projects. I'm sure they're effective at soaking up rain in specific neighborhoods mm -hmm. and on certain blocks, like you said, but how effective is this method for the whole city? It, it's a start. Um, and if we begin to, to make a start somewhere, um, one neighbor that's not flooded, one neighborhood that's not flooded, or uh, I don't wanna give anyone a false sense that this will re resolve our, our whole issue because we have to have green infrastructure along with our green infrastructure, the pipes, the drains, and the pumps. But we know we have an aged system. So if we begin to make a start and, and incorporate and marry them together, then we can have an impact on flooding in our community. So how do issues of inequity come into play when it comes to who gets flooded the most often and why? So this was swamp area, so it was cheap land. So it was land where um, people of color could purchase land. And so as we pump water from the river to the lake, it's you know the hydrology of it is from highest to lowest and we just live in a low in a low area the other thing is what's called the urban hydraulic system we've built more land and used more concrete as opposed to the natural settings that was here before so there's nowhere for the water to, to go when you build it up so we have to start using and thinking about other materials that will help to um, absorb water, um, whether it's the natural habitat or if we're using permeable concrete. There are all sorts of methods and interventions that we can use. We just have to expose folks to them to give them, again, those choices to make the best decisions for their families. That's why Healthy Community Services is so important. We're, we're starting that conversation. We're putting it on people's minds before an event occurs. And that's what's excited uh, uh, in, the, in my neighborhood, that people are having that conversation. So it's not just a conversation that's going on when it floods and what is the city going to do about the flooding. It's about all of us doing something about the flooding, and we can start to take those steps by installing green infrastructure projects. Thank you so much, Angela Chalk with Healthy Community Services. Thank you again for having us. Major funding for Sinking Cities, Peril and Promise was provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos with additional funding from Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III and the Mark Haas Foundation. Additional funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Lise Strickler and Mark Gologli. Sinking Cities was also supported by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and viewers like you.